Welcome to Conversations with Marsha. This is sponsored by The Great Connections, an educational institution specializing in innovative and transformative programs for young adults. We help them build a life of adventure and creative achievement. I'm Marsha Familero Enright. I'm the program director. Please visit our website at thegreatconnections.org. In Conversations with Marsha, we discuss a variety of issues related to optimal education with a wide variety of guests. Please hit the bell and subscribe. Today, we're fortunate to have a wonderful guest, Carrie Ann Biondi, who holds a PhD in philosophy, is an adolescent program manager and coach at Higher Ground Education, and is a humanities guide for their Academy of Thought and Industry high schools. She also serves as a book review editor for the journal Reason Papers. Carrie Ann taught college philosophy courses for 26 years, the longest as Mary, at Marymount College in New York City, where she used Socratic seminars extensively in her classes. She's also written a very informative and thoughtful paper on the nature and results of such seminars. I'll link, I'll link to it in the program notes. So welcome, Carrie Ann. How are you today? I'm doing well, Marsha. Thank you for yeah. having me on your show. Good. Thanks for, for coming. Would you tell us a little bit about yourself and your background and um, how you learned about and started using Socratic seminars? Sure. Uh, there are a few stages to the story. So let me start with my own undergraduate education, which is where the first glimmers began. Uh, believe it or not, I was painfully shy when I was younger. I almost never spoke in classes, actually not, not voluntarily until graduate school. So as an undergraduate, I was a very conscientious student. I would read everything and come to class and listen to lectures and be asked to memorize and summarize other people's thoughts on papers and exams. And in my junior year, I came across this dialogue in a class, the Unifro, and I was really struck by it. It was one of the few times I started rereading something that was not fiction it, and uh, I, was trying to figure out why I was so gripped by it. And it was because this was supposed to be based on real life conversations that Socrates would have with people around him. And they were talking about important things that mattered to them. And they were learning. I was like, wow, learning through questioning and like talking with people together. Uh, that's not how my education has ever been from kindergarten all the way through college. I would just sit and listen to lectures and dutifully take notes and memorize what needed to be memorized. And I get A's for that. And suddenly I'm hit with this new method of something I, I didn't know existed because I didn't have it my own education. And I knew I wanted to be a, a teacher of some sort. So I was like, I have to remember this about learning through questioning and talking with people. But I was a, an American studies major as an undergraduate, minors in literature and history. I went to graduate school for American studies initially and got a mas my first master's in that. But based on uh, recommendations from faculty, they said, you really seem to be interested in ideas. Why don't you try a philosophy course? Mm -hmm. And I didn't, I changed my major to philosophy in graduate school. Mm -hmm. So I went on and got a second master's in, in philosophy and then a PhD in philosophy. So it was really actually during my early years, the shift mm -hmm. from masters in American studies to masters in philosophy where I discovered uh, through a few different ways mm -hmm. uh, how to teach Socratically because I knew I was engaged by the model of Socrates questioning and talking with people. Mm -hmm. So what I, I vowed when I teach my own courses someday, which began in 1994. So it was actually when I was working on my second master's, I was just wrapping that up, mm -hmm. that I uh, was assigned to teach my own first independent philosophy course. And I was like, okay, I'm gonna do it like Socrates did. Mm -hmm. uh, and I didn't really quite know what I was doing. I just knew I was inspired by that model because mm -hmm. I didn't want to lecture. Uh, and I wanted to do better by my students than I had experienced in my own education. So first was by trial and error. The second stage was uh, I got an invitation to a Liberty Fund conference. Mm. And Liberty Fund runs their conferences on a Socratic seminar model. And this really enriched my understanding of how this could be done. I, mm. So I went through a trial and error with my own students 
to being immersed as a participant and learning from the inside how to how I got prepared for it. So I started trying to figure out through trial and error, how can I get my students to that sort of place that the, the discussions just exploded in these amazing uh, intellectual connections, understanding of text, thinking about how it matters in one's life. And then in 1997, I came across a book in a bookstore that changed my life by Michael Strong oh, called yeah. The Habit of Thought. Mm -hmm. And I said, oh my goodness, this is the book I've been waiting for all my life. Mm -hmm. uh, it really, it's about Socratic seminars, but also about Socratic practice in a very hands-on way and practical way, what it means, how to really cultivate it in your classroom with your students for any age, really. Uh, and so those were the, really the stages I was first drawn in by Socratic platonic dialogue about Socrates, then you trial know, and error, Liberty Fund, and then Michael Strong. And so why don't you explain a little further about what Socratic seminars are and what Socratic practice is? Oh, sure. Uh, Socratic seminars where people come together, uh, they all have uh, experienced and, and thought really deeply about a shared objective study ahead of time. And they come together in conversation uh, with a certain set of norms that you're going to engage respectfully, that you're going to ground your claims uh, made about the text or whatever the object of study is. It could be a painting, a piece of music, a piece of intellectual text, uh, and ground it in the evidence that you see and use that as the starting point. So the the, the seminar itself, you come prepared with something shared to talk about and so the seminar experience is where you, you build up your understanding together and interrogate together. Mm -hmm. So, so you, if I could just interrupt you. For, so sure. you, you mean that um, you have a text, for example, and if you as a participant have an opinion about the text, you have to point to evidence in the text. What did the author say, where exactly, and everybody else can go and look at that. And then you, give your opinion and your reasoning from it, and then other people take off from there and discuss, do they think you're right, wrong, or they add on it, it's that kind of thing? Exactly, exactly. So it can't be, you just don't come in uh, with an unhinged claim. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, you need to be accountable to the reality of the text. And if you offer an interpretation of it that can be challenged. Other people will say, well, I think it means this other thing and here's why. And so you're, and they're part of the practice. So this goes from the Socratic mm -hmm. seminar to, well, what's the practice of it? Mm -hmm. So there, there are two different things. There's the occasion of the seminar itself and there's the practice behind how is this thing done and how can you cultivate your ability to engage in a Socratic seminar over time through certain sorts of practices. Mm -hmm. and, and so one of them has to do, I think, with really listening to other people and being willing to change your mind based on evidence. Mm -hmm. So there's a kind of intellectual honesty there. Mm -hmm. You also have to, have to be willing to take a stand to be, to be courageous. Uh, the practice of being evidence-based, whether it's in the text or if you're challenging the text based on something in the world that you've experienced, like bring that in, be very specific about what it is and, and, and the flexibility and openness to change your mind uh, if a claim of yours is challenged. So there, and there are some other, other elements of it too, but the practice part of it has to do with how you over time develop a community of individuals who can engage in Socratic seminar together. So it's not uh, debating where yeah. one person is trying to prove they're right and the other person is countering them. It's you're trying to think together about the material and you give the other person's opinion kind of the benefit of the doubt and you try to consider it. Well, what is, does he, does he or she have the evidence for what their opinion? Is there real evidence in the text? Is there something else in the text or the painting that might make me think something different? And here's why. Exactly. That kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Offering a justification. And uh, it's not about being right. It's about truth seeking. Mm -hmm. uh, truth seeking in relation to things that matter. Mm -hmm. uh, 
so that it, there's a, an integrity there too that of uh, a way of being when you're in this kind of conversational space that's very diff debates about winning mm -hmm. uh, Socratic engagements about learning uh, together and trying to figure out what's true because your idea whether your ideas are true or not really matter because mm -hmm. you're going to live and make choices every day based on those ideas and so when uh, to me I, I try to emphasize how important this is with students because I say ideas matter your life matters uh, the world in which you live the choices people make together as a community it's a political society legal systems uh, all are grounded in ideas and beliefs and if you think they're right you think they're wrong, you need to know how to think about them and to offer reasons to persuade people to change their mind or to be persuaded by the reasons they offer if they have more well-grounded reasons. So they, they, they think they end up experiencing the practicality of mm -hmm. practicing mm -hmm. this sort of approach. Yeah, I was going to say, uh, it ends up being, would you say it ends up being revealed in this kind of discussion the connections between the ideas in a text and what's going on in the world, because people can relate the ideas to what's happening. Uh, you know, maybe you're reading Plato's Republic, in which he's saying, well, we're, we have to have this top down system and everybody's uh, in some kind of order, they're, they're assigned their role. And the, the this, the participant can say, well, gee, that reminds me of this situation in the world or that situation. What was the result of it, you know? Is that is that what you think a uh, part of what happens, how you yeah. expand yeah. your understanding? Mm -hmm. Yes, and even if uh, for younger students who don't yet know a lot about the world, they just haven't experienced enough, they haven't mm -hmm. really studied or learned enough history uh, or followed uh, the news, uh, they can at least make baby steps by connecting it to things in their own life. Mm -hmm. you know, when, can you, get, do you have an example where they might do that? Uh, sure. Uh, they Well, for example, they, one, of, one of my favorite texts is Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics, mm -hmm. and he devotes a, a lot of space to the issue of friendship. So I find that uh, for students who are on the younger side, actually introducing them through uh, philosophy, through uh, topics that they have experience with, mm -hmm. such as friendship. They'll say, well, you know, who's your friend? Why is that person your friend? Have you had arguments with friends uh, over what? Uh, is it important to have friends? Why do they matter to you? Mm -hmm. uh, and then issues about trust or my friend lied to me or my friend hurt. That's not really what a friend is. Oh, so what does it mean to be a friend? And, and uh, wh why do you value the friends you have and so so we can build up from that and that some people are kinds of people might be better friends than others mm -hmm. uh, people who have uh, shared the parts of themselves with you uh, people you can trust mm -hmm. you don't and so they start building well what are the characteristics of a good friend and and then they start then they as they learn more they can connect those personal meaningful issues about this topic and they don't realize that they're actually doing very fundamental level philosophy building mm -hmm. up learning how to build up concepts uh, learning to see why they matter offering reasons based on experience reflecting and even watching like students who were uh, middle school age uh, learning how to navigate a really sophisticated philosophical discourse uh, in ways that illuminate their own experience and sometimes they they change their mind or they become much more conscientious or mindful mm -hmm. about who they have in their lives how they act in the world and maybe improve their friendships over time or more, more careful about who their friends are uh, or drawing boundaries between what friends should and shouldn't be allowed to do to you and and such so. What what a wonderful outcome for adolescents, especially because they're struggling to understand the world and especially their relationships with other people. And it's not like they're getting a lot of help with what's going on in the culture. And here you're having them uh, learn about one of the, an ancient text that has so much relevance. And it, that's that's wonderful, Carrie Ann. 
Yeah, that's just wonderful. And they're, you're improving their reasoning. I mean, that's one thing that um, I think comes out of this kind of dialogue is that your reasoning gets so much sharper. Is, would you like to talk about that at all? Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. uh, it's their ability to not just think independently, because and to me, that's really a, a core aspect of Socratic engagement. It's active learning. It's intellectual independence. Uh, but that comes and from the practice of saying, OK, here's something that I see. Here's something I've experienced. What do I think about it? What are my reasons for it? And learning how to build up uh, from like a mini argument basis, mm -hmm. uh, uh, a line of reasoning for something and then listening to other people do the same thing. And, mm -hmm. in a, and if they listen carefully and take seriously questions other people might raise, or they maybe they provide additional evidence, but from different spaces of experience that mm -hmm. augment, they can start putting together a much more coherent and richer kind of argument for their views about the world, their views about themselves, based oriented toward reality, and also be willing to listen to challenges, take those into account, maybe modify their views. That's the essence of actually writing a really good philosophy essay, mm -hmm. is to have, here's, here's an, a view you came to through careful consideration, and here's the thesis, here are the reasons, here are some challenges, how should I, I would respond to them, and where do you end up and why? And why does it matter? And that's the heart of a great Socratic conversation. And that's basically like a well-reasoned, carefully thought out philosophy essay. And that has a, a lot of uh, effect on your own life if you can do that. Because, yes. yeah, go ahead. Yeah, because th that when you know why you believe something, you are then confident in your own mind. Like that's one of the most powerful things a student said to me back in the 1990s when I was first teaching. Uh, at the end of a course, she said, "This, I had no idea how difficult this course was going to be. It was an introduction to philosophy course. Mm -hmm. I had no idea how difficult it was going to be or how rewarding that challenge was going to be. She said, I think the, the main thing I got was that I'm not afraid to talk to people anymore. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I'm actually, I'm still I'm getting a little teary just for being yeah. reminded of her, yeah. her comment. And I know what she means to learn to know your own mind and being able to stand on your own two feet without being dogmatic, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. with a confidence and a trust in your own ability to think. Nobody can steamroll you mm -hmm. when you know your own mind. Exactly. Uh, and that's why she wasn't afraid anymore. Mm -hmm. She knew how to reason. But you know how to trust ability to think. Boy, and that's something we need more than ever today with all of the intimidation going on. It, yes, exactly. Because uh, I, sometimes I think when you said intimidation, I right away I thought of the bully, <laughs> the mm -hmm. playground bully, but also people being bullies with their words. Mm -hmm. and they, they shout in a sanctimonious way at one another, and they're not listening. They're absolutely convinced they're right. They're not open to hearing counter arguments or viewing counter evidence to their claims. And they think by yelling louder or by name calling that they're going to win the day, but that doesn't change minds. Mm -hmm. And uh, to be able to step up to and stand in the face of that, to withstand mm -hmm. a verbal bully uh, is not easy for people to learn how to do. It can be done and you can just let that wash over you when you know your own mind and, and just say, well, wait a second. What is your claim? What is your exactly. evidence? What's your argument? Just yeah. cut past that right. and not be intimidated and say, all I heard you say is this claim. Yeah. What's your reason for holding it? Yeah. And if either they'll have something to say or they won't, the conversation will continue or it will stop. And you've you've called them out on something in a very level-headed, even way. So, okay, you haven't given me a reason to change my mind because yeah. you have no argument there. 
and hear, but if you'd like to hear why I believe what I do, which is different from what you believe, we can keep talking. Exactly. I know when it's happened to me online, I'll just, I'll point out the logical fallacy. Oh, well, that's, that's an argument from the majority, or that's an argument of intimidation, or that's an argument ad hominem. I'll say, so what's your argument? <laughs> you know, that's a exactly. logical fallacy. Yes. And then they have, to, then they have to, and I just keep doing it until they either give me an answer or they stop, you know. Um, and part of that reason for that, I think, my personal is for the audience, whoever else is following the argument, so mm -hmm. that they can see that, well, there is a different way to approach things than just to throw names around, you know. Yes. And so the, and, and it takes a lot of substantive practice and work for people to learn how to get themselves in that position. Mm -hmm. It's very helpful to have uh, guides or role models along the way who can work with people to help develop that. Mm -hmm. uh, I know I was not naturally that way. I was naturally intelligent perhaps or hardworking, but I didn't know how to do this thing. It, it, sure. I, I saw models out there, whether it was in the, the, the Youth of Freud Dialogue, the Liberty Fund seminars, and then uh, having an experienced uh, Socratic guide like Michael Strong actually write it up in a book. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, now I can try it out myself and then see, you know, what about this approach do I think is valuable to experiencing? So it's not, I don't apply it um, in a rule bound way. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, it evolves or I think it evol evolves organically for every Socratic guide. Uh, in practice. Mm -hmm. And uh, so each Socrates person who teaches Socratically, I've, I've found has a slightly different take on mm -hmm. how it works or what works or what works with different mm -hmm. students and why. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, because you have to approach each student differently. So, yeah. uh, and, and unfortunately, we were talking before our, this recording started, about the fact that so many students um, grow up, well, like your own experience where you have to listen and get tested and listen and get tested, and you don't really have a dialogue or discussion much about the material that you're learning. So you, for example, uh, now are working with adolescents and with high school students who've had that kind of, some of them have had that kind of education the whole time. And now you're having to wrangle them into, uh, understanding that in the dialogue, it's a, it's a much different kind of learning experience. But once they learn it, it's really challenging and exciting. Um, yeah, and it wasn't, it's not just with younger students. I had to, I had the experience of uh, maybe wrangle is the best verb, but <laughs> I, I was just thinking, is there a, a different verb that would capture at the college level, just as much as the high school or middle school yeah. level. So and I've now used Socratic as an approach toward guiding at college, middle school and high school levels. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and it, for people who come to this way of being in the classroom together from a non-Socratic background, uh, no matter what age they are, uh, it's a bit of a shock to them. And mm -hmm. it takes a lot of work and a lot of patience to help people relearn how to learn differently. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, for one thing, they're not used to asking questions. And that's key to this kind of discussion is to, to have the questions come from the participants, not from the teacher. Because then the, the, the participants are really engaged in the discussion if it's their own thing that they're curious about. Yes, but they, they do need to be acclimated to it. So in a certain way, at, at least in initial conversations, even if it's at the general level of a guide saying, well, what does this mean? Mm -hmm. uh, do you think this is true? Why? Mm -hmm. Just even to open it up that way and sure. to know what sorts of questions or the types of questions to ask. There are many types of questions and they're not all going to lead to uh, Socratic conversation when people have no idea how to do it. So, so there you're saying that one of the guides functions is to model what kind of questions to ask of the, the work that you're looking at together, right? Yes. And also to help them by offering scaffolded types of assignments 
and ways of practicing getting ready for Socratic. Mm -hmm. uh, so sometimes Socratic can be done impromptu. That works better with, uh, with students who uh, maybe are more practiced at it. Like, oh, let's take a look at this thing together. And if they're used to bringing uh, a way of seeing and thinking mm -hmm. to a new object on the spot, it, it will go much more smoothly. Mm -hmm. uh, it works better if they're experienced it ahead of time. So if you assign, say, a mm -hmm. page and they have to learn what active reading is mm -hmm. and uh, that involves several things. So then, well, what's the practice of active reading? What's the practice of annotating a text? It's, it involves, but it's not just looking up words you don't know. Maybe mm -hmm individuals or events are mentioned who you've never heard of before, look them up. Okay, well, that's just basically like word level or referent meaning. Mm -hmm. What does this paragraph mean? What do you think the author's main point is? Can you summarize it in your own words in a sentence? Mm -hmm. And then once uh, students learn, okay, so that's a deeper way of in engaging with the text. Look up things you don't know. There's so you a might lot assign of them. You might oh, assign yeah. them. To, yeah. I assign them to scaffolding. Like, you're, you're yeah. kind of explaining your scaffolding. First, yes. they look at this, then you recommend they do this. And yeah, and then once they they maybe do a second or third read through of a text, uh, then they're like, oh, this is what I think the author is getting at. Mm. Oh, wait a second, I'm not sure I agree with that. Ah, okay, why not? So what 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 kind of challenge are you bringing uh, based on your understanding of the text? What questions do you have about those ideas? What experiences you're going to bring in to push back on the author's claim? And, uh, and so it's these multi-layered aspects of active reading and annotation. And it, it can take uh, several weeks of students practicing that uh, and me giving feedback on, mm -hmm. on their practice for them to be ready for a really vibrant Socratic conversation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let's see, let me just check if I have, okay, you've been telling. Um, how did you fit it into, I know you you taught at Marymount Manhattan College for many, many years, which I don't think it's a Socratic seminar school like St. John's Annapolis or anything. It's just a traditional? Uh, yeah, mo I mean, it is a small private liberal arts college and a number of the classes were discussion-based. So faculty were always free to uh, use whatever method worked. Some used the lecture method, uh, others used discussion-oriented method, mm -hmm. but not all discussion-based classes are Socratic. Mm -hmm. And when students would come into my courses, they would think they're ready for Socratic engagement because they had other classes where they would discuss uh, whatever the course was about. Uh, and so they came to realize this, not all discussion-based formats are the same. What so, was the difference with their other classes? So even with uh, discussion-based courses, they can take many forms. I'll just mention a couple that come to mind based on my own observing other people teach uh, as well as feedback from students about how their experience of it differed. Uh, sometimes it was more like, I guess they would, the old fashioned term is like, oh, it's kind of like a bowl session. Mm. What is using like, oh, how did you feel about this text? And then students will go off on, oh, well, this is how I feel. And oh, this is what it makes me think about. And so sometimes it's more like loose associationism mm -hmm. and they would never get back to the text. Mm -hmm. Now, it's not necessarily bad to transcend the text, mm -hmm. but if uh, you, was, you assign some material that had important ideas, you need to, it's important, well, what is this text on its own terms? What does it mean? What can you take from this? Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so the loose associationism, it's like, well, what are they now talking about? Mm -hmm. And it's very easy for students never to actually feel like they're accountable to understanding the material of the course. Mm -hmm. So that's, it would sometimes go in that direction. Another direction is, it was very clear that uh, sometimes the, the teachers would ask a question, but it was very leading. Mm -hmm. And there was a right place to get, and it was often ideologically motivated. Mm -hmm. So the, 
uh, I think sometimes I would observe or hear students say that over time, it's pretty clear what the right answers are supposed to be. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and students would feel like pressured, like there's a right direction to go in. And you just have to learn to pick up on what does the teacher want. Mm -hmm. And that's really a fake discussion. Mm -hmm. So those are two examples that I think contrast with what Socratic is when students are like, oh my goodness, this is not at all what I thought it was going to be like. So you as the guide or the teacher in a Socratic seminar, um, how does that, <clears throat> excuse me, how does that work in terms of your own opinion or how do you, how do you present yourself in the discussion? <laughs> Oh, they'll, I did that because it's like, I keep my mouth shut. Yeah. Shut up and get out of the way. Uh, and I actually have a little argument in a paper I published on exactly this point, because a lot of students would say, I want to know what you think about, you know, do you think that there's a God or not? Uh, which political system do you think is right or wrong? You know, or, you know, what do you think about this argument on the mind-body problem? It's like, what I believe, apart from me very clearly taking a stand for you becoming your own independent thinker. That is pretty clear where I stand on that. Intellectual independence is important. It's central to the method. Apart from that, I'm not telling you what I believe about anything else. Mm -hmm. and, uh, for t and the two main reasons for that. One, I think that for students who are very conscientious and want to learn, they often place like the, the teacher as, oh, here's somebody who's read more than me, might be smarter than me, and knows a lot more. Mm -hmm. So if the teacher believes it, then it's probably right. And they might squelch their own views mm -hmm. and not even consider alternative views. And they will, their own intellectual independence is suppressed. That's like the student in sort of like in good faith, but not have mm -hmm. their own confidence. There's another type of student who, if they think a professor believes something, for all their assignments, they're going to find out what does the professor believe. Mm -hmm. I'm going to defend that in my papers and my essays, exams, uh, in the hopes of getting a better grade because I agree with the teacher, mm -hmm. even if they do or don't. So they become, that's like in bad faith. And they actually don't learn anything. What they learn is to calibrate what they produce to what the teacher believes mm -hmm. and they they don't get to know their own mind mm -hmm. so both of them it undermines entirely i think the purpose of students getting to know their own minds uh, on their with their own intellectual abilities mm -hmm. so especially younger students and not just like minors but at the college level, for students who are taking introductory level courses, I never let them know what I think. Mm -hmm. Maybe if a student's a senior philosophy major. Uh, you might leak it a little. <laughs> it, yeah, they might get a little little bit. But even then, I'm like, oh, wait till you graduate. Then we'll have a few throwdowns over coffee. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> That's great. That's great. Uh, so you've you've now you recently in the last few years started working in this Montessori program, and how would you say is the how do you find the relationship between the Montessori philosophy and Socratic seminars or or if you find any, any clashes or is there a relationship between them and how does that work? Oh, that's a really good question. It's one I've been wrestling with as I've been working with higher ground education. But higher ground education uh, is comprised largely of guidepost Montessori schools, which are infants through uh, sixth grade, the upper elementary, and Academy of Thought and Industry, which was really how I came into higher ground education, uh, is middle school and high school. Uh, actually inspired by uh, Michael Strong, founded the first Academy of Thought and Industry school. Mm -hmm. and, so it was, that was very Socratic based. And so I've really been learning a lot about Montessori method and principles and trying to figure out how to extrapolate them for the plane of development that the adolescent is at and to what extent Socratic can be integrated with that. So my, my views on this are still developing as I experience what <laughs> this is like to do. Mm -hmm. uh, I think there is a certain amount of tension, uh, at least initially, because the Montessori approach is about the 
development of each individual child at the pace they are uh, based on their interests, but with a very uh, supportive, prepared environment for them at whatever level they're working. And so there's a very well worked out integrated curriculum across the years, and but they can go at their own pace. So there's like a differentiation about their level and pace that they work at. And if they're interested in US history or world history and which units can they do and dig down into further. So to that extent where students are working more independently and individually, uh, they may not be at the same place and have the same shared object of study to ground the Socratic seminar in. Uh, that doesn't mean that Socratic practice can't be developed because I could, like right now we're talking Socratically, like mm -hmm. thinking and reflecting and, and such to a certain extent based on the shared experience of being Socratic educators who've also, you, know, you much more than me in a Montessori background, uh, but having something shared to work with. Uh, so uh, if students are at different places and different levels and may not want to do Socratic today, they're working on this particular science experiment where they're doing it by themselves, mm -hmm. uh, then uh, th those who are choosing to come to Socratic, uh, it would need to be planned by the few students who might be, we're all working on reading Rousseau's social contract, maybe some 10th, 11th and 12th graders. And can, would, would you be willing to set aside time on Friday mm. to, to be you know, a guide in this, with us talking about those, or they may go do it on their own without a guide. Mm -hmm. the, the Socratic seminars will be more emergent as students are choosing to share an object of study together. Mm -hmm. And so it, it pushes up against having a classroom structure where here we have this history class a couple of times a week mm -hmm. uh, and at this time. And it may be the case that some of the students are in the same rough space together and are all ready to discuss Socratically some, something together that I can support. But other students in the class might be in other places and I need to support them where they're at. Mm. So their individual learning journeys. So it's not that Socratic can't be part of it. It could be me and a student engaging with a text Socratically uh, in a, se a separate meeting. It could be a group of a few students who are all interested in the same thing, or it might be more formal where I can say, hey, I heard a bunch of you want to work on you know, Aristotle's ethics together and have a weekly reading group uh, and I can guide that for you if you want me to, and we set it up and those who want to choose to come to it. So mm -hmm. it's, uh, I'm still figuring out like mm -hmm. how, because the way I've done Socratic uh, for 25 or plus years now has been, well, when we come together as a class, mm -hmm. every single time, pretty much, we're doing Socratic together. And mm -hmm. there's a pre-assigned reading or pre-assigned activity that you come prepared for. And the Montessori approach isn't like that. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, I have to, I'm still working out how the Socratic gets integrated in a more organic way mm -hmm. um, in relation to uh, the Montessori approach to supporting students in an individualized way. Mm -hmm. So you're, so in, in your, your role as the academic coach, you're dealing with individual students and helping them with their projects as well as offering Socratic seminars for some topics. Exactly. But you don't exactly. have a regular, you don't have a regular, uh, I, I mean, I would think you could offer as a regular part of the curriculum, some part of the day, in, say in the afternoon, okay, every once a week, we're going to do Socratic seminars and have different kinds of topics, partly because um, students need to be exposed to a lot of different material that they might not know about. I mean, they might not, they might have their interest in engineering or literature or history, but they might not realize that ge geology or bacteria or something like that are really interesting. And maybe that's something new to learn about. Absolutely. Yeah. So there's a, a, a part of the, the courses that I develop courses in the humanities uh, as well as guide courses mm -hmm. uh, 
for Academy of Thought and Industry. So part of it, uh, uh, the liberal arts course for the high schoolers is uh, essentially like a, an integrated humanities curriculum mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that the guides who guide it support the students through. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and they integrate readings, not just from across the humanities, but social sciences and mm -hmm. sometimes uh, and, uh, <clears throat> the starry messenger. Like that's, mm -hmm. that's a, a, a very scientific and mathematical ex you know, explanation of, you know, learning about astronomy. So, what is Starry Messenger for our audience? Oh, uh, Galileo's Starry Messenger about uh, learning how uh, Jupiter has four moons is one part of the argument and how uh, he redesigned telescopes in order to observe the night sky. Hmm. Those, are, those are two big parts of it. There are some other elements to it, but it's a, it's a really fascinating essay that mm -hmm. I think it's both scientific and you can do philosophy of science. It models uh, philosophical thought. It also has talks about the beauty of a learning and beauty of understanding the, the natural world around you. But there's also the rigor of mathematics and the calculations about, well, based on what I observed and the mathematical calculations, X, Y, and Z have to be the case. And mm -hmm. so this integration of math, of science, of philosophy, of I think the aesthetics of wondering mm -hmm. about the beauty of the world mm -hmm. and uh, trying to figure out the order of the world. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's that's just one example, but it it it's all part of. Uh, a unit on uh, science, invention, innovation, mm. which cuts across all fields, really. And what's wonderful about a work like that is that it helps students to learn about the integration of knowledge, that everything, uh, knowledge is all connected. And that makes your mind so much more powerful when you have that idea, because then you can start seeing how history is related to science, is related to mathematics, is related to literature and all these, how all these things developed and affect what's going on today in your very life. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, the, what the building blocks of what Galileo was offering and others later, Newton, et cetera, were building on, or what enabled the Mars, you know, where we're to Over. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. So it's when people are like, oh my goodness, right? Where, where does it start? How, how does that happen? Well, yeah. it's from thinking like this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and all, all that that involves uh, and it's uh, so for, for students to put those two things together like they're watching they're so, so some of them are like or have you know like Mars watch mm -hmm. they, they follow it and and they're like oh man if I have to read this old text who is this guy and, <laughs> and it's like well actually the two are let's just read it and you can figure out the implications and, yeah. and uh, exactly. what it, what that's connected to how these two events, uh, that there's really a through line. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, now, you originally started working with the students in person in New York City, if I yes. remember. But because of what's happened last year, you transitioned to Zoom. And now you're working with students from uh, Academy of Thought and Industry has five schools? Uh, well, uh, currently, uh, three high schools, three high schools. and uh, mm -hmm. virtual students and, and uh, several middle schools. Mm -hmm. Uh, all over the country. And um, what's your what's your experience about using the Zoom technology for doing Socratic seminars? Uh, well, I I still prefer in person for all kinds of reasons. That there are ways of reading a person, seeing their whole self, <laughs> and and knowing that when you're there together, you're there together with each other, looking each other in the eye with the awareness that nobody's on their texting on their cell phone and not distracted by having a pet on their lap. Uh, you know that they're, you, you're aware of one another's physicality of the space that you're working in. And you can tell, you can read from a person's posture in person much more effectively, whether they're disconnecting mm -hmm. or tired or distracted. And that allows you the information 
as a guide to help draw them back in. Mm. Or you can move around and say, okay, let's break down to small groups and you two work together and 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 uh, and to get keep the energy going like mm-hmm. that. So have like that Socratic flow. Mm-hmm. And in Zoom, it's very much more difficult. I mean, on the one hand, it's nice because I get to experience students from all yeah. over the mm-hmm. world mm-hmm. in all different time zones mm-hmm. and get to know students I may never have met in person because mm-hmm. they don't live anywhere near an ATI. So this is their experience, ability to experience this uh, curriculum with this approach to teaching Montessori and with Socratic integrated, mm-hmm. uh, which they may not get otherwise. And that's really wonderful to introduce them to. But people can turn off Zoom cameras mm-hmm. and they they can disappear. It's almost like they've you know left the building and to and to try to engage that way and foster engagement can be very challenging, especially if uh, I'm not getting that visual information that I'm accustomed to getting. So it's partly an adjustment on my part. Mm-hmm. How, what are the best practices of Zoom rooms, maybe learning how to use breakout rooms mm-hmm. for, for conversations and going in and circulating among them mm-hmm. to make sure to touch base, see if people have questions or your camera's on mm-hmm. uh, before we come back together as a whole class. So mm-hmm. it's a, it takes, I think, a lot more work on the guides part to uh, facilitate uh, very vibrant Zoom conversations. Mm-hmm. At least I experienced that way. Much more difficulty doing it this way than in, than in person. And, and I would imagine that one of the problems is that a number of your students probably weren't Montessori students, though. So they come with this background <clears throat> uh, in traditional, where they are used to just listening and trying to do minimal work just to get the grade. And and there's all kinds of problems that arise from the expectations, the kind of expectations you mentioned that are in traditional and that are quite different than the kind of engagement where you really want to be, you want to hear what that student actually thinks. You want them to be participating and they're not used to it. Um, or they're not used to, they're not used to knowing how to ask questions either. So. <clears throat> exactly. And it, to the extent that it's more challenging to get uh, people involved in a Zoom format, it, it's more challenging to get them acculturated to Socratic practice. Mm-hmm. Exactly. So, uh, but t- you mentioned something very important. There are uh, a, a lot more students who come into the Academy of Thought and Industry, uh, middle school and high schools, who are not from a Montessori background, uh, who are not from the, the guidepost Montessori's or maybe other Montessori programs. And so they're not used to the method. Uh, uh, but that was the case at college too. And yeah. actually that's part yeah. of the reason, yeah. one of the big draws for me to move from college to younger ages was that so many of my college students, it was really a fundamental epistemological issue. Mm-hmm. Like they didn't know how to learn, how mm-hmm. to think for themselves. And a lot of students would come into my classes who are like, well, I was always an A student. How come I'm getting C's or D's or yeah. F's <laughs> on essays all of a sudden? Like, I, I'm not an, a D student. It was like, well, on this assignment, you were. And uh, so let's talk about all the feedback I wrote on your essay and, mm-hmm. and what the assignment was asking for. And students struggle with learning how to think for themselves. It was not easy. I say 50% of my work as a college professor was helping them learn how to relearn mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and get out of those uh, poor uh, habits mm-hmm. of being grade motivated, of, of looking to memorize and regurgitate right answers that the professor or teacher told them were the right answers. And they would be very frustrated but the students who like really were willing to learn how to do this and work through it, reap the rewards mm-hmm. of, of this and f- said, oh my goodness, why didn't I learn this earlier? Yeah. And I wish I'd had classes like this when I was in high school or younger. I was like, mm-hmm. that would have been awesome for me too. Why don't people learn this at a younger age? Well, maybe if more people like me worked with students at younger ages, more people mm-hmm. wouldn't be learning mm-hmm. how to do this. So, uh, so I wanted to migrate toward the younger ages so that I could use this 
uh, approach uh, to learning, which I think is much more empowering for mm -hmm. every individual. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and so I actually, even though there are a number of students who come into ATI without a Montessori background, at least they're learning it earlier than when I had mm -hmm. students at the college level who mm -hmm. come in with zero such background at the younger ages. So yeah. it is it is having to, uh, for some of them, or many of them, relearn how to learn and to say, look, it's, we're, it's not an assignment of grades. This is a mastery-based approach. You give individual feedback and, and I write you know, I write up feedback for you and, and mm -hmm. kind of like an apprentice, mm -hmm. like working toward uh, your mastery over material over time. And it's not the same as getting a grade, mm -hmm. not to be motivated by grades or mm -hmm. memorizing things uh, or to be told what to think. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's a, it does take time. Uh, but the once students start experiencing being able to do it, and yeah. feeling from the inside, yes. how much that matters to them, they yes. feel much more in control of their own lives yes. because they are much more in control of their own minds. Mm -hmm. They can introspect, they can talk to other people and uh, it, it's, some, it's a cycle that feeds on itself. So mm -hmm. they read differently, they talk differently, they mm -hmm. listen better mm -hmm. uh, and then their writing improves. Mm -hmm. And so it's this kind of, uh, empowerment cycle mm -hmm. that they experience over time. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's fantastic. The results, the results for the individual are, are fantastic. You know, I, 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 maybe the audience doesn't realize the reason why I was asking you about the Montessori students versus the other students is because Montessori students tend to be very engaged in their learning. They have not been incentivized earlier, you know, the, in traditional learning, you're incentivized very early to compete with each other, to go for the grades. All these things are very distracting from actual um, self-initiated learning. And so, but the Montessori students are, are not doing any of those. They're in, really engaged in their learning. So they come to a Socratic seminar already with a, a good approach to learning. And then you're teaching them even further about how to do it. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And uh, I think two of the, the hallmarks of that I see when students come in from a Montessori background, they love to work. Yeah. They love the acts of self-creation that's involved in the choices they make. They love learning about things. They don't wait for anything to be assigned. Right. They're like, hey, I, I want to learn more about this. You have like, what, what are the best two articles for me to start with? Or, uh, or I, I looked up something and, and I want to bring it back to the class and share it with everybody else. Mm -hmm. And they just seize the reins. There's something so fantastic about that. And then the students become role models to one another. Mm -hmm. I can, I don't have to be that. I mean, exactly. I still am responsible in part for maintaining the integrity of being that way with the students. But mm -hmm. part of that integrity is also knowing when to step back and let the students step up because the because it's um, they're not separated really by grades. It's like mm -hmm. multi grades in a classroom. Mm -hmm. So you could have uh, somebody who's 12 years old and who went ahead on his own to read an entire philosophical work mm -hmm. and come back and lead just jump right in and say, hey, I read this and there are these ideas and uh, what do you think about them? And talk about that with 15 and 16 year olds. Mm -hmm. And that's that's really a hallmark of learning how to uh, take the initiative. There's a leadership of their own learning that they take and a willingness to do all the work. Like some of them hunt down footnotes, like. They're like graduate students in the makeup. I just <laughs> yeah. absolutely find them remarkable. Like, yeah. and from a young age, they do this. They hunt down everything they can find on something that they're fascinated by, and they mm -hmm. will work weeks on end every day mm -hmm. doing this thing they love. I don't have to assign them anything because mm -hmm. exactly. they dig into it and they realize that knowledge comes by each person learning how to think about the world learning how to put it all together. Mm -hmm. And it's not, I come in and lecture at you 
and then you memorize it and just regurgitate it. Mm -hmm. That's not learning. That's not knowledge. Mm -hmm. They don't know anything when they do that. The student who has taken that initiative, they know. Mm -hmm. And so they, they have this, they've cultivated this ability to love their work. Mm -hmm. And they've, they have learned how, what knowledge really is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I remember there were two boys at our Montessori elementary school who would get a math lesson. They always liked to work together. They would get a math lesson. And then when they grew up, they told me that their, what they would do was their challenge was to come up with so many more problems from that lesson that they didn't have to go back to the teacher for the rest of the morning. So that <laughs> That's kind of fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, that kind yeah, of it, it doesn't have to be done solo either. Like what, with this example of the two students who did this together, so they, and that's actually shows the power of friendship in learning. Mm -hmm. like to tie it back to Aristotle and, exactly. and what students find is like, wow. So friends, it's not like, oh, friend, you do stuff with friends when you're done with work and school's yeah. out. It's yeah. like, no, people, your friends love you. They love mm -hmm. doing things with you. And if you love to work together, Mm -hmm. That's a very powerful bond to share, mm -hmm. and uh, whether it's in you know, one person or there's a small group of of students who do that, and they become like lifelong friends. Yes, yes. Well, and what a great way to learn how to collaborate for when you're going to work in the adult world, right? The yeah. enjoyment of collaborating on your work. So, um, oh gosh, I had one other thing I wanted to bring up. Darn, I forgot it. Uh, anyway, is there anything else? I don't want to keep you too long. Is there anything else that you'd like to say about Socratic seminars or your experience that you'd find, you think the audience would find interesting? Um, maybe one thing that I learned uh, from all the, the years I had worked with college students. Uh, Socratic is a very it's like a third way. Mm -hmm. So there, there, there are two types of students who I, I don't just two types, but there are two types of students who they come in with very distinct talents. There's a conscientious good student mm -hmm. who had done everything they were told to do, like very conventional, but mm -hmm. excelled at that conventional approach. Uh, then there's the students who are very bad students according to that model like ah, I don't need homework or I don't like your assignment so they have, they're more independent but they're also very undisciplined mm -hmm. and more willful and I found that when those two kinds of students mm -hmm. come to a Socratic where it's much more disciplined evidence-based uh, it won't squelch they're sometimes at first afraid that it's going to squelch their creative brilliance <laughs> it's actually going to allow it to shine better because now you're grounding it in something where you can persuade yourself that it's true and mm -hmm. offer reasons for other people maybe to consider why it might be true. And in, in such a format, like they learn how to write essays <laughs> instead of like three page paragraphs mm -hmm. that where there might be like, you know, bits of brilliance here or there, but it's very unruly and, and, and almost incoherent. And so working with those students to the rigor of reason, mm -hmm. uh, it will allow that brilliance to shine in a way that they can communicate with others and also make clearer to themselves. Like, do I still really believe that? Is this true? And then, then that brilliance can shine better. The more conventional student who knows how to write the five paragraph essay and will put in 60 hours a week to do the work. Mm -hmm. um, but it becomes a grind and it doesn't connect with them internally. So Socratic empowers that student to find the work meaningful. So mm -hmm. all those hours put in suddenly, that's my work. Mm -hmm. And now I have something to say. It's not just me summarizing other people's words. Mm -hmm. So the, the, there are these, so the, the more conventional straight A students, and then there's the uh, the, the more wily, <laughs> uh, <laughs> independent-minded ones. Mm -hmm. who, and so the best of what each has mm -hmm. uh, will not be dimmed. It'll be highlighted mm -hmm. by undergoing this kind of more Socratic approach. 
that's also compatible with the Montessori approach mm -hmm. and to and to kind of bring a rigor and structure to uh, the brilliance and the work is more connected to the student's own motivation mm -hmm. to, to learn more and to create things that come out of who they are as individuals. Mm -hmm. So I think that's the, that's the thing I'd really like to bring out most is the deep individualism, mm -hmm. respect for individuality mm -hmm. of Socratic Mm -hmm. uh, can enable people coming from any sort of background or habits mm -hmm. to kind of recreate themselves in ways that are more them. They can become more themselves. And mm -hmm. I can't think of uh, anything greater to devote my life to than helping people reach those places for themselves. Well, that's wonderful, Gary Ann. Well, thank you so much. I've really appreciated your time. And I think uh, you're, you've done a lot to help our audience understand what this kind of learning is, which I think is just so important to spread the idea about this because it's it's such an empowering kind of learning. So thank you very much. Well, thank you, Marcia. Take care.